Hello, welcome to the Pine and Lily chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. This is our monthly speaker tonight, uh, live. We have a state renowned speaker and we're looking forward to that. I just wanna remind everybody who enjoys these presentations, if you'd like to participate in conservation, join the Native Plant Society in your area. Okay, and now um, we have uh, Scott Davis, who is a um, educator uh, and works for the State Parks Department and is a milkweed expert and specialist in the state of Florida. Hey, Scott. Hi, Karina. Thanks for that inter introduction. Does everyone hear me? Yes. Cool. Is that, uh, so is this my cue to get started? Can I go? <laughs> yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, uh, good evening, um, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm always happy to talk about anything related to native plants. And uh, this particular subject matter uh, relates to the uh, intersectionality of plants and insects, which makes it doubly interesting in my opinion. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and, and jump in. Uh, we're here this evening to talk about um, Florida's native milkweeds and um, the importance of Florida's native milkweeds to uh, monarch butterflies um, throughout the state of Florida. Um, so um, we'll be talking about this through the guise of something known as the Monarch Milkweed Conservation Initiative, um, which is a, uh, it's a statewide endeavor um, with the primary partners being uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, the Friends of St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, and the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, it's a very ambitious project to map milkweeds across the state and to work with policymakers uh, in cities and municipalities to protect these really important plants. And so, um, Many of us uh, are aware that monarch butterflies have undergone a very large precipitous decline across North America. The migration is imperiled um, and uh, U.S. Fish uh, delivered uh, a determination a few months ago that many of us were not happy to hear about. Uh, but despite all of that, um, I want everyone to take away from this presentation this evening that the monarch butterfly is it's it's not a conservation issue the way the Florida panther may be a red wolf or a gray wolf for that matter. A monarch butterfly um, is a, a relatively easy fix. Uh, bringing the numbers back up is really just a function of bringing back up the numbers of milkweeds. And that's something that all of us can do in our yards and our properties, in our neighborhoods, so on and so forth. So uh, we can save the migration of a monarch butterfly if we all work together. So uh, to really drive home for you um, the way, uh, way monarch, eco monarch milk ecology works across the majority of the state, um, I like to sort of give a scenario to illuminate that. So here is a relatively unattractive looking roadside. Um, and uh, for those of us that are botanists or recognize plants, we generally engage in what's known as NASCAR botany, everywhere that we go and everywhere that we drive. We recognize the patterns and silhouettes of plants down to the species level at 60 miles an hour. And uh, on this particular day, um, I pulled over because I saw something and I had a feeling I knew what it was. So I got closer and upon further investigation, I saw that it was a large population of sandhill milkweed, uh, Asclepias humistrata, uh, growing along the side of US Route 319. And these plants were uh, not documented by anyone and uh, there was no particular management plan in place. And that concerned me not only for the milkweeds that were growing there, but also because upon further investigation, I noticed that on these milkweeds were lots of little signatures of monarch butterfly caterpillars. And uh, these particular plants were covered in monarch caterpillars. And this was in May of the year, um, and uh, which is the year that migratory monarchs typically return to Florida. And uh, 
chiefly utilize sandhill milkweed in a lot of regions in the state. And so I immediately contacted FDOT, um, of which every district has a vegetation manager slash coordinator. And uh, I also checked with the county to see if uh, the county commissioners had signed a wildflower resolution, uh, uh, which they had. And uh, with uh, FDOT and that uh, county commissioner endorsed wildflower resolution in place, we were able to implement a reduced mow schedule for those plants and uh, thereby allow the plants to flower and fruit and seed uh, without being mowed prematurely and without uh, impacting the monarch caterpillars that were there. And, oops, let me go forward. Um, I need to update this uh, map, um, but uh, all of those counties that are in green are counties where the commissioners have signed wallflower resolutions. And uh, I feel like a, much of the community is unaware of these resolutions and that um, if you identify where a number of these plants are, you can often work with FDOT and your commissioners to uh, mitigate for any sort of impacts related to mowing, potentially road widening and things like that, where these plants persist. So uh, please uh, utilize these resolutions. So um, the reason why milkweeds are so important for monarch butterflies is because monarch butterflies are larval host obligates uh, to milkweeds. And so what that means is that monarch butterflies really can, they can't lay their eggs on much of anything else other than milkweeds or milkweed ally species that are closely related to milkweeds. And so, um, so without milkweeds, uh, monarch butterflies uh, can't reproduce. Um, yeah, sure, the adults need flowers uh, as a source of nectar and food, but their caterpillars need milkweeds. And by that, I mean a lot of biomass in milkweeds in order to reach adulthood and move on. And so milkweeds, uh, the common name is derived from the fact that the vast majority of milkweed species, if you break a leaf or a stem, they exude a, a white latex-like sap. Um, and uh, there are some other uh, types of plants in the state, notably euphorbias and spurges that can also have that white sap. Um, but as far as milkweeds are concerned, aside from two species in the state, um, all milkweeds exude white sap. So that's a good way to know what's one way to indicate if you have a milkweed or not. So milkweeds are in the genus Asclepius, um, which is spelled with uh, an A at the end. This is spelled with a U at the end because Asclepius, variably spelled in a few different ways, uh, refers to uh, Asclepius or Esclep Esclepius, if I'm saying it correctly, which uh, essentially was a Greek deity that was the embodiment of goodness and well being and, and medicine. And uh, plant taxonomists and botanists when they were first profiling uh, milkweeds, they looked at the long ethnobotanical history that milkweeds have with people. We've used them for food, we've used them for cordage, we've used them for a lot of different things. And so taxonomists at the time decided that we needed to give, give a name to milkweeds that really drove home what, what, they, what they meant uh, to us. So they, that's why they're in the genus Asclepius. Um, and so their classification, um, taxonomically, um, they are uh, related to oleanders. They're in the oleander family. Um, the, they're related to dog banes. Uh, they're related to confederate jasmine. Uh, so it's a wide, broad family around the world uh, with representatives on most continents. Um, and the broad family is known as Apocynaceae, uh, with the milkweeds occupying some subtribes in that family here in North America and Central America. So there is a very high milkweed diversity to be found throughout the state. We have 21 native milkweed species and that is without speaking to all of the milkweed vine species that we have around the state. Um, I do not have all 21 species of milkweed on this one, uh, this one image here, but these are all of the milkweed species that I could find within a, a five mile segment of US 98, just to drive home the diversity and beauty of this genus of plants 
and all of the different natural communities that they occupy throughout the state. So milkweeds have very unique uh, conversation topic uh, flowers. Um, often they provoke thoughts of a science fiction movie uh, or an eldritch horror or something like that um, because the flowers are so unusual. So here you can see the horns protruding at the top and they are enveloped by a flanging hood. And on the sides, they have something that's known as a stigmatic slit. And this is a photograph on a Asclepius virigula, one of our uh, rare milkweed species. If you look at it from the top, they look like claws coming out to grab you and hold on to you. And uh, that is actually the evolutionary purpose among others of those, those horns is to grab onto insects and keep them there a little bit longer so that the, the chances of pollination might be a little bit higher. So stigmatic slits are something that you will find on all milkweed species and it's important to keep in mind uh, that this is this is a good part of a milkweed flower anatomy to, to keep up with because uh, this is basically the, the point of pollination. And so, and I'll come back to pollination here in a little bit. So uh, milkweed morphology is super variable. Um, you can have some like that one on the left, that's Asclepius verticillata that has whorled leaves, um, verticillate leaves, and then it looks more like uh, something that is not a milkweed. It looks like a liatris or something else. Whereas the milkweed that's on the right looks more typical of milkweeds that um, I think most folks are familiar with having uh, opposite and paired leaves. So a very super variable leaf morphology. And then we'll go ahead and come back to pollination. Um, it's really important to, to understand milkweed pollination and uh, the connection with insects that are not monarch butterflies. So milkweeds don't produce pollen. Milkweeds produce uh, pollen sacs um, and those are known as pollinia. And so the pollen sacs are kept in structures that are on either side of that stigmatic slit that I mentioned earlier. And the only way generally for them to be removed from one plant is for an insect with the appropriate type of appendage to land on that flower and to get stuck in the stigmatic slit. If the insect gets stuck in the stigmatic slit, and is able to free its appendage, it will it'll pull out those pollinia. And then as if that was not already complicated enough for pollination, if the insect is able to get free from the flower and often they are not, many insects uh, lose legs in the process of trying to sip on milkweed flower. But if they do get free, the aroma and the taste of of milkweed nectar is just so good that these insects are tempted to land on another milkweed and on another flower. And so they often do. And if they do, they typically get stuck again and reinsert their leg into another stigmatic slit on another flower. And if they insert that pollinia into another flower, pollination has successfully occurred. This is why it's very difficult for people to pollinate milkweeds because it it's something that essentially involves uh, going internal to one flower, extracting something, and then going internal to another flower on a separate plant. And I emphasize separate because it's important to take away that milkweeds are generally not self-compatible. You need at least two milkweeds that are sexually distinct to cross pollinate with pollinia in order for pollination to be successful. So here's a photograph I worked very hard to take where a bombus species of bee uh, had landed on this flower of Asclepius viridis. And when it did, it inserted pollinia into the stigmatic slit with success. And so this flower will go on uh, to turn into uh, a fertile seed pod or a follicle. And so just for scale to show you how small these pollinia are, this is what they look like. And uh, they're very difficult to extract from one flower and typically more difficult to insert into another flower on another plant. So we really need insects for our milkweeds. And 
most milkweed species require very specific insects um, uh, to that particular species. Some need butterflies, some need bees, uh, some need flies. So uh, we really we need our uh, insect diversity to be up there to increase the likelihood of pollination. If pollination is successful on a milkweed, the uh, you'll start to see that the pedicel on the flower, the stems and the stalks that are underneath the flower will begin to thicken and then they will recurve. And so if you start to see that on your milkweed flowers after the colorful part has dropped off, that typically means that pollination has occurred. So you can look on the sandhill milkweed and you can see that the one that's not pollinated is very skinny and is likely to fall off uh, probably that day. Whereas the one next to it that was successfully pollinated has broadened and is beginning to recurve and this is going to form uh, a seed pod. So uh, reproduction with milkweeds is, is quite complicated compared to uh, a number of uh, mo most other plants. So um, this is what a super successful milkweed looks like. Many, many flowers, uh, relatively speaking, were pollinated on this sandhill milkweed. Those are all seed pods that are full of milkweed seeds. And so uh, this, is a, this is a big day for this sand mil sandhill milkweed. This is also a really easy way to spot them um, uh, because you, it's not always easy to find milkweeds after they're done flowering, uh, but usually you can see those horns pointing straight up uh, uh, from really far away. Another way to spot them from far away, unless you're down on your hands looking for them, is to look for the comas. A lot of folks uh, see these comas, these white fluffs, um, and they think that it's cotton um, or some sort of cotton ally. In reality, these are the, uh, the, excuse me, the structures on milkweed seeds that help to disperse them across the landscape. And so the vast majority of milkweeds produce these comas on their seeds because the vast majority of milkweeds are wind dispersed. Uh, the only native exception to that here in Florida is aquatic milkweed, Asclepius perennis, which does not have any coma because their seeds are water dispersed. So uh, the time that is required for a seed pod on a milkweed is highly variable. Um, so for example, the, the follicles that are on the left require on average seven months to, to ripen from the time of pollination. So typically in April or May, the flowers will be pollinated on that species and that's red ring milkweed. And usually it's October or November before they, they are uh, viable. Uh, the, the species on the right, that's longleaf milkweed, they require usually about 30 days. And so there's a huge disparity in time between these milkweed species and how much time is required for their seed pods to reach maturity. And that's really important information to know if you're working with FDOT, uh, with land managers, uh, and planning a mow, uh, and I guess depending on the rarity of the species, planning a burn, uh, because if you mow them prematurely, they may not flower and attempt to produce fruit again until the following year and then you create an evolutionary trap. So it's really important information to know. So uh, for those of us involved in milkweed conservation, if we're trying to ethically collect uh, a percentage of seeds uh, from a wild population somewhere, or if we're trying to collect, a pop, uh, collect seeds from plants that are imperiled or are going to be destroyed, um, often those plants are in far away places, hours away, um, at the end of a dirt road, and it's not easy for volunteers to get out there and collect the seeds. Uh, and so uh, hair ties are often the best friend of the uh, plant ecologist who's trying to collect uh, seeds of milkweeds. You can uh, put a figure eight band on seed follicles and often that produces a means of at least holding some of the milkweed seeds so that you can make a collection later on without having to come back every day to see if the seed pod has ripened. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give you a crash course into monarch biology and ecology since I just gave you a, a crash course into milkweeds and then come back to talk about the uh, interaction between monarchs and milkweeds here in just a little bit. 
And so uh, I think most of us know what monarch butterflies look like. Um, and uh, so um, we know that, um, I think a lot of us don't realize that they're four-footed butterflies. So if you look closely at a monarch butterfly, you'll actually see that they're walking around on four appendages instead of six. They, they do have six legs, but the front two legs are vestigial and they hold them close to their body and they don't really use them. And so um, that distinction uh, places them in the subfamily known as the uh, nymphality or the four-legged uh, butterflies. And so if you look at this uh, phylogenetic tree right here, which it's kind of complicated. All, all I really want for, for folks to take away from this is that monarchs are four-footed butterflies and also that monarchs are tropical butterflies. We tend to think of monarchs as a temperate species that we see across uh, continental North America, um, but they, their evolution was in the tropics and um, they are not cold hardy, which is why they have to mass migrate from this continent to head to Mexico. So four-footed and tropical. So uh, I think we, we know what they look like. Um, we do have some lookalikes out there engaging in some mimicry. So often, um, especially in areas that are wet, where there's a lot of willows, you are probably seeing a lot of viceroys. Viceroys are, are with purpose trying to mimic a monarch because a monarch is far more toxic than a viceroy is. A viceroy feeds on willow, uh, which uh, has salicylic acid in it. And so they're kind of bitter to eat, but not necessarily toxic the way a monarch is. But you can tell a viceroy when you see it because a viceroy will have a transverse black line running through those other black lines, venations, that helps to separate it. They also tend to be smaller. Uh, the other primary lookalike in the state is the queen there at the bottom. And the queen is actually closely related to monarchs. It's in the same genus. Um, but if you look down at it from atop, you'll see that there are no black venations to be found uh, on the hind side. Uh, dorsal side, which is a good way to separate that, separate queens from, from monarchs. They also tend to be smaller and uh, they do not migrate. So uh, there are some differences between male and female monarch butterflies. Um, so if you uh, see two little black spots on either side of the abdomen, those are adroconial scales or adroconial uh, spots. And um, those spots are found in a lot of butterflies and a lot of lepidopterans. And uh, in many species, they exude pheromones to help to aid in finding, finding a mate for reproduction. Um, androconial scales in monarch butterfly males are also vestigial. They don't use them anymore, uh, but they most certainly help if you're in the middle of a monarch butterfly survey and are looking at uh, demographics. It's a good way to spot a male. Uh, whereas females tend to lack those, those androconial scale spots. You won't see that. And they will typically have broader black veins that you see um, atop or below. So that's a good way to uh, quick identify if you have a male or a female most of the time. So the life cycle in uh, non-migratory monarch butterflies is typically only about a month. Um, in uh, migratory butterflies, it's much longer. So uh, if you're walking through your garden um, or in a natural community somewhere, um, often the first indicator of monarchs that you'll see is not the caterpillar itself, but you'll often see the frass, um, the caterpillar poop. And um, if you look a little bit harder, normally you'll find the, the caterpillars. But the real first uh, sign of a monarch butterfly caterpillar is usually found on the bottom side of the leaf. It's a very small, uh, usually creamy colored egg. Uh, it's less than a millimeter wide. Uh, females prefer to lay, lay the eggs on the bottom side of the leaf, but if milkweed resources are in short supply and if you have, uh, and or if you have many females all competing to lay eggs on just a few plants, they start to just deposit their eggs, top, bottom, stem, flower, 
all over the place. And it only takes a few days for those eggs to hatch and to undergo some very uh, dramatic increases in growth. And so uh, in entomology and uh, specifically within this context with, with, it, with monarch butterflies, um, monarchs go through what, are, what is known as five instars of growth uh, before they, they pupate to become a, an adult butterfly. And so if you look in that image on the right, you'll see that you have the egg and then you have the, the hatchling. So then you have one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, dramatic increases in growth that occur, and that usually occurs in two to three weeks, depending on where you're situated geographically. So they grow um, pretty fast and bioaccumulate a lot of toxins that are found in milkweeds. And the, the toxins that they are bioaccumulate are known as cardenolides, or um, some people call them cardiac glycosides. Um, and it's a compound. And as the, the word might uh, sort of hint at you, uh, this is something that can affect your, affect your heartbeat or the heartbeat of many other animals and uh, or can cause you to have a heart attack. And so this is the primary reason why monarch butterflies bioaccumulate the, uh, and eat milkweeds is to uh, uh, cardiac glycosides. So um, usually after two to three weeks, uh, they will begin to pupate. Um, um, and then um, after they've uh, been in there for, for a few more weeks, uh, they'll begin to emerge. Monarchs prefer to emerge in the morning. Uh, naturally. And uh, after they emerge in the morning, they spend a few hours uh, unfurling their wings and pumping fluid into them so that they can be begin flight. Uh, we have some issues in certain urban areas where if there are city lights or a bright light uh, that's adjacent to where monarchs are, are pupating, um, they can emerge prematurely in the middle of the night and they can begin to flutter and fly towards that light. They can uh, hit them over and over and over again, hurt themselves. Uh, many of them hurt themselves, uh, hurt themselves mortally. Um, uh, and so um, it's, that, that's an issue. So if you, if you have monarchs in your yard or if you have a milkweed population in your yard or nearby, if there's a light that's very bright along a roadside that may be negatively impacting those monarchs in that area. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, so reproduction. Um, so usually um, a non-migratory monarch butterfly can have the entirety of its life cycle wrapped up in about a month. Females that are not migra migrating will live longer than males. Um, often males uh, start to die off after a month. Um, but all of this information sort of goes out the window when we're talking about migratory monarch butterflies, um, which uh, have a very different life cycle. So the monarch migration, uh, which is something that uh, the northern half of Florida gets to earnestly uh, and happily experience every year is uh, one of the more amazing phenomenons in the animal world, where every every fall, um, usually in October through December, sometimes into January, you can find, especially along coastal districts um, on the Gulf Coast and also in some places on the Atlantic, uh, large numbers of monarch butterflies um, that are all together, um, all feeding in the same place. And all of these monarchs that you're looking at um, have typically come from very far away distant places. Um, and so this is a photograph of, of migratory monarchs uh, that I photographed in Wakulla County. And uh, many of these were tagged um, uh, later on. And uh, so the migration is really interesting. So I'll try to go through this and explain it to you the best I can. So let me go ahead and fast forward to April. So let's see. So right now, um, generation one monarch butterflies are flying into Florida. They uh, were reared on milkweeds in Texas um, over the last uh, month or so. 
And then um, after they pupate, they begin to move east and they move north. So right now and for the next two to three weeks, if you go out to wild milkweed populations, you're going to see these big pulses of monarchs and eggs being deposited on milkweeds. Um, and typically by May, um, that's when monarchs are here in earnest and uh, they lay eggs that will go on to become the next generation. And so May and June monarchs here will pupate and then continue east and north. And usually in high summer is when uh, monarch butterflies will arrive in the mid-Atlantic states, the um, Great Lakes region, they'll lay more eggs. And uh, then those, those butterflies will emerge and continue north. And uh, that generation will arrive at the northern limit of milkweeds in uh, southern Canada. And by this point in time, four and sometimes five generations of, of monarch butterflies have born and lived and reproduced um, just to get the species back up into Canada throughout the growing season. But something different happens with generation four and sometimes five, and that has a lot to do with cold weather. So during the fall of the year, monarch caterpillars, which are feeding on milkweeds in uh, the northern half of, of the United States, um, southern Canada, they are exposed to uh, cool temperatures and temperatures that are becoming increasingly cool. And what happens is it triggers a biochemical reaction within those caterpillars such that when they emerge um, from their chrysalis um, in these northern areas of the United States and Canada, they have no interest in reproduction and uh, they have gone into what is known as reproductive diapause. And so all that these monarch butterflies wanna do is eat and fly south. And that's what they do. So it is generation four and sometimes five that makes the entirety of the migratory route all the way back down from those Northern climes and funnels through Florida in the fall of the year where they hit the Gulf Coast and then follow it all the way back down um, into Mexico before cutting across the mountains. And so um, that is their approximate fall route. Um, and I have this on here uh, just to drive home the fact that we know that although a majority of monarchs that come into Florida migrate uh, west and continue south into Mexico, that there is definitely a notable percentage of them that fly south into the peninsula and uh, interact with non-migrating monarch butterflies. They, um, their sexual diapause ends, they become sexually reproductive, and they complete their life cycle here in peninsular Florida. Some of them even fly farther south and have been documented through biochemical signatures um, in Cuba. So we know that they, a, a percentage of them fly south of the peninsula and complete their life cycle here. We don't fully understand uh, why a percentage of them go, go down into Florida while the majority go over to Mexico. Um, most research shows that the percentage of them that are staying in Florida and not going to Mexico is gradually increasing. Um, and there's a, a not, there's a few reasons uh, that have been conjectured as to why that is. So whenever they're moving south, um, the, the two really important things for monarch butterflies to find in the wild landscape and in the cultivated landscape of your yard is going to be food and shelter. And so in the fall of the year, um, monarchs uh, typically feed on asteraceous plants uh, of which many, many, many aster family plants are blooming that time of the year. Um, and uh, they tend to rely heavily on uh, one to three species of tree to sleep at night. And so by far the most important food source for monarch butterflies in the fall of the year are salt bushes in the genus Baccarus. There are three species of Baccarus found prevalently across the state of Florida. There's a fourth rare one in South Florida. 
And the blooming phenophase for these plants coincides with uh, the arrival of monarch butterflies. And uh, salt bushes are not self-compatible. So there's a male salt bush on the right. There's a female salt bush on the left. Monarch butterflies are one of the primary pollinators, cross pollinators of this plant, which blooms at the same time as a monarch does. So there's quite a bit of mutualism going on here between the monarch butterfly and the salt bushes. Salt bush is by far not the only species that provides uh, a lot of food for monarchs in the fall of the year and, and to a lesser extent throughout the year. Um, other flowers do as well. Um, other notable species, uh, helianthus, uh, the sunflowers, solidago, the goldenrods are also very important flowers. And so um, for the migratory monarchs that do make it to Mexico um, and into the region that's west of Mexico City, um, which is generally known as the Oyamel, um, this is what uh, it can look like in one of the hibernaculums where monarch butterflies um, will spend the winter. And uh, the OML is uh, a region that has dense stands of a, con a coniferous tree uh, that's in the, gen the genus Abies. Um, so it's sort of like a fir or a spruce, that's what it would look like. Um, the monarchs amass in these trees. And uh, despite what uh, you might be tempted to think about, about what they do when they're there. They don't just sit in one place for half of the year. If the days warm up, they will flutter down to the ground from the trees and sip on wet soil. Monarchs love to mud puddle, just like a lot of other butterfly species. Um, and then they'll fly back up and land back in the canopy, um, which is often very cold, it can be in the 40s and sometimes the 30s. So it's not a warm place. Um, it's just not necessarily a super cold place either. So these are a number of the historically known hibernaculums uh, where North America's migratory monarchs go to um, just west of Mexico City. And these are all mostly situated in the trans-Mexican trans volcanic beltway mountains. It's a mouthful, but it's basically just uh, a, it's a, it's a, it's a beltway of uh, uh, volcanic, active uh, mountains where these trees grow. And so a very important place. And uh, one of the ways that we know that they go there and uh, one of the primary ways that we know that they go there and that they also come down and, and finish their life cycle in Florida is through tagging. Uh, tagging, monarch tagging is, is a big deal. Monarch tagging is done across much of the United States. It's done in Canada. It's done in Mexico. Um, and uh, it is a, a multi-partner joint effort to try to figure out what's going on with monarchs, where they're going, and how they're doing. And so for the last eight years, um, I have been, I've been part of numerous groups uh, through US Fish, uh, Florida Native Plant Society, and other organizations who have gone out in the fall of the year at five and six o'clock in the morning with our nets. And this is what it looks like right before the sun comes up. So you'll have uh, what are typically red cedars, uh, in this case, Southern red cedars, Juniperus silicicola and uh, cabbage palmetto. So red cedar and cabbage palmetto are the two preferred trees for monarchs to sleep in. We'll go and find where big stands of those are, and we will capture the monarch butterflies with nets. And then after we capture them with nets, we'll go ahead and we'll put a tag on them. Um, there are many instances where we have captured monarchs that already had tags on them, which is, that's the really exciting part of doing this monarch tagging, uh, because that's where you can actually extract qualitative and quantitative data about monarchs and where they're coming from and what they're doing. And uh, so we record the information um, on each tag that we place on a monarch and also for each tag that we find on a monarch. And then that data gets uh, uploaded into various databases uh, with some notable organizations and also with state agencies, FWC, US Fish, uh, Monarch Watch, Many of them uh, partner to collect this information. 
And so, uh, for example, just to really drive home to you the importance of this information, this particular monarch butterfly uh, was captured and already had a tag on it. So we went ahead and recorded the data on that tag. And uh, we went and looked up that information online. And when we did, we were able to determine that this monarch butterfly had flown 977 miles south from the original point that it had been tagged 31 days earlier. And so this monarch had actually originated from Southern Canada where it was tagged. So it really drives home uh, how far they come and how far they're going since many of these are recaptured farther down the line, Louisiana, Texas, and even down into Mexico, which works to confirm uh, where they're going. So it's been a number of years now um, but the monarch butterfly was petitioned uh, to be listed as federally protected uh, back in 2014, actually. And that was in response to a horrifying precipitous decline in monarch butterflies. Um, so um, numbers in the billions had been documented um, in time past and uh, on this particular year, they had documented less than 50 million monarch butterflies. So uh, going from billions down to 50 million is very, it's a very staggering decline. So some might be tempted to say that 50 million is a lot, but we've had uh, major storm issues in Mexico over the last few years where 500 million monarchs have been estimated to have been killed in one night. And so 50 million is nothing. Uh, and it's very scary. And so uh, the petition was submitted. Um, uh, it was a joint petition by the Xerces Society, Center for Biological Diversity and the Center for Food Safety. And uh, earlier this year, uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, what direction do we, do we go forward with. Uh, US Fish uh, determined that monarch butter, that it was warranted for monarch butterflies to be listed but that there were other conservation priorities related to more imperiled species that had to be prioritized. And so, um, and uh, you know, US fish is swamped with a tremendous amount of petitions and species. And uh, usually it, it's, it's not uncommon for it to take 10 years for an assessment for a petition species to be completed. So it takes a long time. And uh, there are other species that in 10 years time have gone from endangered to nearly extinct. And so those have to take a precedent according to what US Fish has said. So the primary threat south of the border has and continues to be illegal logging of OML products. Um, most countries around the world, including the United States, uh, will not purchase this product. Um, um, there are some East Asian uh, countries that still continue to purchase this product and there's a high demand for it. And as a result of that, it has created some issues culturally um, in this region where uh, there is a conflict between uh, local people uh, and what has emerged as timber mobs and gangs that have come out put pressure on local communities. Uh, they have uh, come out and uh, threatened the lives of people, killed people uh, to the point that um, it's really blood money at this point to, to go down and uh, to, to cut these trees. As a result of how big of an issue this is, many of the remaining great stands of OML in Mexico are guarded by Mexican soldiers with, with, me with machine guns. And uh, the Mexican government really is doing quite a bit um, to mitigate for this um, and in their preserves. Um, and uh, what we really need is for a number of these countries that are purchasing these products to stop importing it so that the demand ceases. So that's the primary threat south of the border. North of the border, um, it gets a little bit different. So here's just to show um, and it's not displaying very well, uh, but this is a this is an OML mountain mountain stand that was logged in 2008, 
And um, the issue with logging these trees is that although uh, many, many people may be tempted to say that, well, you know, the trees will grow back. The issue is that it takes a very long time for these trees to reach the point of age and size that they create the microclimate that is conducive to maintaining a hibernaculum for monarch butterflies. And honestly, the monarch butterfly migration doesn't have decades, if not centuries, to wait for these trees to grow back. It just does not. So um, we have to conserve the trees that are there, the old growth forests. North of the border, there's a number of different issues that are implicated in uh, monarch butterfly decline. So um, a very obvious notable one is, is development. So uh, land is consumed for um, residential development, industry, and agriculture. Uh, it's over 6,000 acres per day on average that is, is developed um, um, in the United States. Here is a sandhill milkweed that is growing right next to a for sale sign. And um, I, I removed this milkweed um, uh, and translocated it. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that uh, milkweeds have a very low reproductive rate. They grow slowly. Um, and so the word weed is misleading with these plants uh, because uh, usually when you lose an acre of, of milkweeds, um, it, it's not gonna come back unless human beings intervene to reestablish it there or somewhere else. Um, because of their ecological constraints. So another issue with monarch butterflies is OE, Opriocystis electroscira. It's a protozoan organism that uh, impacts monarch butterflies throughout the world. And uh, it has uh, markedly high mortality rates associated with it within the migrating monarch butterflies in North America. Uh, the mortality rates are lower in non-migrating monarch butterflies, uh, but higher in migrating monarchs. And OE has been spread around the world by a number of means. And one of the notable means, uh, notable vectors for moving OE around the world has been uh, the cultivation and uh, commercialization of exotic milkweed, Asclepias curus africa. So OE um, can uh, show several different symptoms. It can, uh, you know, it can impact the larvae um, before they pupate. Um, often it will not kill uh, a caterpillar. It will instead uh, impact, adversely impact an adult, rather just before they pupate or after they pupate. So if the chrysalis turns black and you don't see any orange, in there that can often uh, indicate the potential for there to be a, an OE infected monarch butterfly within that chrysalis. Many times they will emerge from the chrysalis and have shriveled wings, shriveled wings that are, are mortally shriveled to the point that the monarch can't fly is a major indicator of OE infestation on that newly emerged monarch butterfly. If the monarch butterfly does successfully prevail through pupation and does not have shriveled wings, usually they are reduced in size, uh, have low vigor, and often if you look at the longitudinal lines that are on the abdomen, you will see that they are blotched um, on uh, monarchs that are infected, inoculated with OE, whereas healthy monarchs will have a contiguous white line on the side. And so that's, a, that's an OE inoculated monarch on the right, and that is an OE free monarch on the left. So OE definitely poses a problem. Um, so probably the, the, the largest issue implicated in monarch decline by most authorities around, around the country, if not around the world, is uh, something that is associated with what's known as the GMO transition. The GMO transition, uh, which is by a number of folks thought to have uh, begun in 1996, um, marked a, a time 
a real critical time, not just for monarchs, but also a big shift in agriculture and, and how we did things. So prior to, prior to 1996, if you had driven across much of the United States, uh, Eastern United States, the Midwest, much of the, the Northern tier, you would have seen that even in areas where there was agriculture, that all of those agricultural fields would have been flanked by monocultures of various milkweed species. This is Asclepia syriaca in this photograph. Um, and uh, these are photographs from the Delmarva Peninsula in, uh, in Delaware uh, pre-1996. And um, these, uh, this is what typical milkweed densities look like for monarch butterflies. Well, the GMO uh, transition occurred. And what happened is GMO Roundup Ready crops were introduced to uh, industry and farmers in uh, North America and around the world. And what it allowed for uh, were for farmers to grow their desired crop plant and they were able to spray their crops with herbicides and it thereby would kill all of the competing weeds. Um, and uh, I, I don't really believe in the word weed, but for the sake of this conversation, and <clears throat> it would not kill the GMO Roundup Ready agricultural crops. And so as a result of the great GMO transition in um, less than two decades, um, really, this is what these same places look like now. We went from having uh, large monocultures of milkweeds and many other diverse native plant species to, in a lot of instances, a clump here, a clump there, um, and in some places, just the complete uh, eradication, extirpation of, of milkweed species altogether. And so many authorities estimate that in about two decades, 167 million acres of monarch milkweed habitat was lost in the United States. And when you look at it that way, it really is just a numbers game. So if that many acres and milkweed habitat has been lost, then it really is no wonder that uh, we've had a 90 plus percent, depending on the migratory year, decline in monarch butterflies. So very, very shocking, um, big issue. So in the process of assessing uh, the monarch butterfly to determine if it needed to be listed or not, and even now, US Fish does this and knows this. Um, at the national level and at the regional level with their regional offices, they said, we've got to get out there. We have got to survey. We've got to figure out where these last remaining milkweed populations are. We've got to, once we identify them, we've got to conserve, we've got to mitigate for whatever issues are afflicting them. And then we've got to figure out how to grow them to get them back onto the landscape. And the Southeastern United States, including Florida, is sort of a, a big, milkweed mystery for a lot of growers because aside from the rarity of finding these milkweeds, it has historically been very difficult to grow them until recent time. And so um, the Monarch Milkweed Initiative was developed. It started at St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, but branched out all over the Southeast. Um, and um, we have collected a lot of information and I'm gonna give you a synopsis of all of that information. Um, and that information should really help you to, to know what the top priorities for monarchs and milkweeds are in your respective region of the state of Florida and in the Southeast. And so when we began to span out and figure out where these remaining milkweed populations were, the, the first question was, well, where are they? No one, no one really tracked most milkweed species because the majority of them are not listed as endangered and they're not listed as threatened. And mo most species, unless they have a status, um, they're not tracked because time simply won't allow or money won't allow for non-listed species to be tracked by government agencies. And so we began to span out uh, volunteers um, all over the Southeast looking for where these milkweeds might be, trying to figure out how to deduce um, where populations are, are or uh, induce with high probability where they might be. 
And um, it was really shocking, the pattern that we began to, to find, uh, we, we found across Florida. So we started to find milkweed populations, hundreds of populations of them. But what was really disturbing is that um, after three years of surveying for milkweeds around the state, over 94% of the milkweed populations that were found were exclusively found on the sides of roads or in right of ways. And so this little image right here shows some points for milkweeds that were found. More than three milkweeds were found at every point. And um, this is inside of a protected conservation land that has not experienced any major uh, impacts aside from very old logging roads back in the early 1900s. And virtually every single milkweed that we found was uh, in the human footprint of the landscape, even though there was a lot of intact habitat here at the site and in the surrounding area. So it was really mind boggling to a lot of us you know, we kept saying, why, why in the world are these plants only found on the side of the road or in the middle of the road? And uh, it just kept going on that way. So we thought, are they just relics? Maybe there were like big impacts to, uh, to these places and, and that maybe the side of the road was the only place where something had not occurred. Well, that that did not, uh, that didn't work because a lot of these places we went and did our research and determined that there had been no major issue with development or soil disturbance or anything like that. So it wasn't that. And uh, so we kept saying, you know, why are these plants like in the most vulnerable part of, of, of this landscape? Why are they growing in the middle of the road or the side of the road? And uh, several years of collecting information um, many people working on this um, and bringing their, their data and their findings together. The uh, collective consensus was that it had a lot to do with fire. And so on the left, that is a, a site that is burned pretty reliably every two years, but it's burned every two years typically in the dormant season, which is the, the cold season of the year. It's not hot. Um, and then that on the right side is an area that has been fire suppressed for five plus years. The only area on that landscape that has been disturbed at a very high frequency and during the growing season is the middle of the road right there. And what, you sh what should really drive home here for everyone is that a lot of research has been done um, notably uh, by a scientist by the name of Jean Huffman. And her research demonstrated that in many regions of the state of Florida, that fire naturally returned to the landscape, in many cases, two years, sometimes less than two years. And it almost always occurred in the growing season between May and September. And so what that means is that Milkweeds are a pyrogenic plant in most instances. They are a fire dependent plant that needs that fire to run through that landscape and keep it open. Milkweeds can't handle fire suppression. They can't handle competition from other species. So this is another site where we surveyed much of what you see on that image. Um, and we just about gave up on finding milkweeds. And then it dawned on me that there were some burn plots out in the middle of this that had been burned um, every two years for a long time. And so we went out there and walked right up onto milkweeds growing in these burn compartments that had been burned reliably every two years. These are, these are fire demonstration research plots. We could not find milkweeds beyond these research plots. So fire, 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 fire. And so just to really drive this home, and because I love looking at historic imagery of Florida, this is an area of the Eastern Panhandle. And the lighter colored area that's in the middle of this, this photograph is an open wet savanna. And for reference, that is a pond cypress growing in the middle of that pond right there in 1952. So just remember that, that little tree right there in the middle of that pond in 1952. And let's flash forward to a more recent time. 
Here is 2018. There is that same pond cypress tree growing in the middle of that same pond. And all of that open wet savanna is not there anymore. And so fire suppression, along with several other land use activities has turned that naturally open fire maintained savanna into a successional forest that is completely incompatible with milkweed species. And so as a result of that, the only place that we found milkweeds in this respective area was right along the side of the road uh, where they were bottlenecking against US 98 on the back slope which is mowed on a, a pretty regular basis. And so what we're dealing with here is that we have milkweed bottlenecks occurring around the state of Florida and really across all of North America, where these plants are holding on for dear life in a very vulnerable place right on the side of the road. And so right on the side of the road, it, it emulates what they had historically out in the woods. The seeds of milkweeds, when they're dispersed, the seeds must contact bare mineral soil. This is not like Biden's alba or some uh, annual or bi biennial weed that actually that pops up in your, in your yard and seemingly germinates in the humid air. These need to touch bare mineral soil and uh, they need for that area to be maintained uh, for a number of years. So for example, these seedling Asclepias humistrata that are in this image, I've been monitoring these seedlings for six years. This, was, this is their sixth year emerging in a, in a fire maintained area. And uh, it doesn't look like they're going to be any taller than about three inches, six years later. And so if these plants require a tremendous amount of time to reach sexual maturity in the wild, that landscape has to be maintained with fire throughout the entirety of that time and then in sub subsequent times so that they can flower and reproduce. So if you don't burn, these plants vanish very quickly into the only parts of the landscape that are still open. And that is usually a road. So for example, in this image, um, we found uh, populations of Asclepias curtisii, we found populations of Asclepias feii, and we found populations of Asclepias pedicillata, and all of those plant populations, plant occurrences that we found were in the dirt roads within this scrub, mesic flatwood, hydric flatwood transition that you're seeing here on, on this image. Uh, because disturbance has not been adequate enough to maintain them in their natural landscape or to at least allow for them to flower and reproduce. And so um, along the way, as we've recorded all this information, we have copious amounts of data and spreadsheets where we were able to look and, and determine for every species in, uh, in Florida, are they fire dependent, which the answer is basically yes for all of them. Uh, we were able to record information on what's the active flower phenophase for each species, uh, when, when the seeds uh, are typically ripening, how much time is required, and many, many other types of data were, were collected along the way to help us to really piece together not only the ecological requirements for monarch butterflies, I'm sorry, for, for milkweeds, but also the ecological requirements um, uh, that you have to emulate in a horticultural setting if you're gonna try to grow these. So uh, a lot of information was collected. So essentially we have roadside bottlenecks occurring statewide. We have the data to back it up. Um, and yes, this does not mean that there are not milkweed populations on public land and on well burnt land because there are still examples left around the state where there are milkweeds in intact natural communities, but proportionately that is a very small number compared to the, the number of them that are persisting along the side of the road. In many regions and in many counties, the only remaining native populations of many species of milkweeds are exclusively roadside only. And in many cases, the, the, the woodland in the background has been consumed by development. And so they are ultimately in that roadside habitat and they have nowhere to go. So it's a, it's a big, big issue. This is on I-75 near Ocala. So um, the implication in that in every county around the state 
is that FDOT and any or any county road or any body that any agency or entity that manages roads, those are people, those are agencies you you want to you want to be working with. You want to be on a, a first name basis with them, really, because what needs to happen statewide and what is not happening statewide just yet is reduced mowing. And so as an example, this is a large population of Asclepius perennis growing on US 98. And this particular population would have been mowed um, on a regular basis or on a, on a higher than what is good basis. But I, with that wallflower resolution in hand, uh, uh, working with FDOT and the county, was able to implement a reduced mow schedule such that uh, when these were mowed, they mowed um, in a way that did not uh, impact uh, the milkweeds. They did a reduced mow. They, they did a narrow band mow. They didn't do a full mow and they also did a reduced frequency mow. And that the technicalities of uh, reduced mowing is the subject of another discussion for another time. But the reduced mowing where it is being implemented is working and it's working well. So right here, right there on the other side of the reduced mow line, those milkweeds, they're doing their thing. They're flowering and that monarch butterfly right there was not mowed down. And so there's lots of success stories going on around the state, but we need more success stories um, around the state. So uh, really, really important stuff. One of our greatest findings from everything we we've looked at is that these plants are on the side of the road and we have got to work hard to protect them there and expand them from there. So many of these species, when you find them on the side of the road, they are growing with other very rare species that have bottlenecked into the same place that the milkweeds have. So for example, in parts of the state um, where uh, this very rare endangered Ruellia grows, Ruellia noctiflora, um, I, what I usually say to volunteers is, if you find longleaf milkweed, you're probably going to find night flowering petunia. And that's, it's, that's a very uh, reliable statement to say. And many of our other milkweeds do the same thing. There are other companion plants that are, in many cases, very rare, that are found growing with them in almost every site. So another issue, another thing we discovered is that a lot of our milkweeds are way more unique than what they may be perceived to be. So Asclepius incarnata may be found throughout peninsular Florida, but a lot of folks don't realize how discontinuous uh, the biogeographies are between pink swamp milkweed here in Florida and elsewhere throughout the United States. Um, for those of us that have surveyed and grown, uh, Asclepius incarnata here in the state. We all know that it is morphologically distinct from species to the north and uh, biogeographically distinct and genetically distinct. And so uh, these, these plants are imperiled um, also genetically because it's very unique genetic diversity that we have here in Florida. Um, we are recording and have continued to record an amazing amount of information about all 21 native milkweed species and virtually all milkweed vines and milkweed allies. Um, how to cultivate them, uh, how to prep the seeds, which ones can be propagated from, by, by cutting, uh, growth rates, what kind of containers, what kind of medium, and we have all of this information, and this is just one little example. Um, I, I have all of this in a, in a larger document. Um, this is just one example. For, so for example, we, we water trialed uh, um, all milkweed species. And here are a number of those milkweed species. So for example, who would have thought that a number of milkweed species um, are not very tolerant of municipal water? They don't like uh, additives, uh, fluorides. Many of them don't do well if the pH is not low enough. Um, for many of them, if you water them with neutral or basic, basic alkaline water, they don't do very well. So they need acidic water, they need rainwater. Uh, lots of uh, interesting things that we, we documented out there in the field that we've been able to extrapolate into the horticultural arena. 
So a uh, lot, you know, a lot of plants we have found uh, have been uh, impacted by development. So all we could find were scraps or pieces of root. And it is amazing how, aside from just a few species, the majority of Florida's native milkweeds can be propagated by cutting if you do it correctly. And so here's an example of uh, uh, a clasping milkweed that uh, we were able to propagate all of these broken roots um, into individual plants. And now keep in mind that that produces more biomass of the individual species, but these are all essentially clones of one plant. And so they're sexually incompatible with each other. So you have to keep that kind of information in mind whenever you're, you're working with these milkweeds to expand their numbers and also keep them where they're reproductive. So um, I also have all of this information outlined. Um, so this kind of just goes through a, a baseline propagation method uh, uh, for most milkweed root cuttings. And um, I, can, I can share a, a document with this information in it, um, or I, yeah, I guess you could probably pause this later on and look at this if you want. It's very easy to propagate milkweed, milkweeds by root cuttings. It's uh, very easy actually. So, but that does not mean that you should not uh, produce them by seed because we need more and more sexually distinct, genetically diverse individuals. So don't be tempted to just mass produce uh, these milkweeds just simply because you can. Do it if you, you know, you have to, or if you have a controlled setting, but keep in mind that they're all going to be essentially genetically identical. So over the last eight years, um, uh, the collective efforts of the Monarch Milkweed Initiative through surveys, ethical seed collections, plantings, and uh, many and numerous rescues, we, we have uh, collected and or germinated and grown half a million milkweeds um, that have gone out to various partner sites ranging from uh, roadsides to conservation lands, uh, state parks where um, land managers are trying to get to get everything right. You know, land managers with FDEP, US Fish, FWC, and throughout the Southeast, I mean, we, we all know now that we need to burn these landscapes on a regular basis. We know they need growing season burns. And so now, now that we're getting the landscape back to the way it needs to be on these public lands, um, a lot of folks are trying to get these plants back. And that's what we've been doing with a huge amount of success. So uh, uh, it's just fantastic to see these, see this data being used to produce plants that are being expanded back into where they once were. So uh, here are a few of the milkweeds um, that uh, have been cultivated and grown through the initiative. Um, and uh, so I have Matilia alabamensis on here, the Alabama milkweed vine, and it's one of numerous species of Matilia and also there's gonolobus. So we, we've grown many different milkweed vine species um, and milkweed vines are pollinated by flies, uh, particular species of flies in most cases. Um, we uh, have rescued and or grown lots of clasping milkweed, Asclepias and Plexicollis. So I have sort of these data cheat sheets for basically the biology and a number of the ecological requirements for um, uh, Florida's milkweed species. And I've kind of put them in here on a few of the species that are likely to be encountered the most commonly throughout the state, um, but I certainly have not put them on all of them. Um, but we, in case anybody wants to take any notes, I've just kind of put them in there at the bottom. We have cultivated um, quite a bit of Asclepias cenaria, Carolina milkweed, uh, which is found across the northern half of the state down into Citrus County. It's probably farther south. It's likely in Hernando County. We just haven't found it yet. Um, it is a, a dainty little milkweed that uh, occupies the same niche as Faye's milkweed, Asclepias faye, and it's actually genetically very closely related to it. Um, but uh, in a healthy environment on a roadside or in a healthy scrubby flatwood or sand hill, uh, there can be many of these, um, which helps to compensate for how diminutive they are. 
uh, Asclepias conovans, uh, the uh, large flower milkweed. Uh, this is a milkweed that we have found throughout the state and it has turned out to be one of our most acid loving uh, milkweeds. It is generally unhappy with water that has a pH any higher than 5.5. It will tolerate it here and there, but it seems to do best when it's in hyperacidic conditions, which uh, looking at water pH out in the wild, uh, it has been anywhere from 3.9 to 4.5 <laughs> in many instances. So uh, this is a great uh, milkweed for growing in wet acidic places. Um, there's some still some great populations of this if you know where to go in Southwest Florida, Central Florida, and in the Panhandle. Asclepias curtisii is an endemic uh, state-listed endangered species of milkweed um, that through rescues and collective research, careful research uh, and observation of seeds and germination has proven to not, not be difficult to grow. And uh, several growers around the state have experimented with uh, growing this and with success. And so this, this plant can definitely be cultivated at this point uh, for restoration in uh, scrub, scrub natural communities, um, and uh, it, that it's being done. Asclepias fei um, is a, another endemic species uh, that is uh, on the straightaway to being listed. Uh, FMPS member Kara Driscoll has done amazing things with research to demonstrate the ecological requirements, needs, densities, and a lot of other types of data related to the species. And uh, so its requirements for cultivation are roughly equal to that of Asclepias scenaria, uh, which uh, I mentioned a little while ago. Asclepias humistrata, the sandhill milkweed. Um, this is uh, probably the most important milkweed for migratory monarch butterflies in Florida and uh, throughout the entire southeastern United States. And the reason for that is because it is the most widespread um, and also simultaneously has uh, somehow persisted in pretty high densities along roadsides in a lot of places. So um, it's definitely not the easiest milkweed to cultivate in the world. And uh, a number of researchers um, have worked really hard to uh, figure out how to grow this plant. And this plant is relatively easy to grow now. If you, uh, if you follow the, the rules and what's been determined and the methods. So uh, we're seeing this plant get back out there onto the landscape. Um, there have been some issues in central Florida where uh, uh, restoration projects have suffered in our efforts to get plants back out there because the soil chemistry had been modified by years and years of intensive citrus management and agriculture. And um, rather the pH was off or the potassium was off, but these are lovers of uh, deep sandhill soils and they, they tend to love acidic sands. Asclepias incarnata, is a widely uh, cultivated uh, and easy to grow milkweed in the state of Florida. You can propagate it by seed, you can propagate it by cutting, um, and it creates a huge amount of biomass really fast. Um, you can produce a one meter tall flowering plant within six months of, of germination with this species. So this is really a fantastic species to cultivate, but despite that, it has become very rare in the wild in many places in the state where it was once very common. I um, kind of took surveying for this species personally and scoured the entire state to try to find some of the last great populations of it. And in looking at lots of historic vouchers going back to the 1930s and 1940s, the vast majority of those vouchers are not there anymore because it's rather developed or it's in an area that's just been fire suppressed for way too long but it's easy to grow and uh, the Milkweed Initiative has produced many thousands of these. Asclepias lanceolata, the few flower milkweed is not difficult to grow. It is a wetland loving species 
And you can typically grow it in the same requirements with the same soil requirements as Incarnata. But the issue with this one is that it has a bit more complicated of a root system and um, it uh, takes a lot longer to grow and establish. Um, and then the upside to that is that it lives a long time compared to Asclepius incarnata, which usually lives about four to five years on average. This one can live decades. Asclepius longifolia is found around the state in uh, relatively discontinuous populations, but where those populations are at, it does very well. Uh, Longleaf milkweed is a very common and very important milkweed species in uh, the Everglades and in the Big Cypress, where it's often sympatric with Asclepius lanceolata and Asclepius verticillata. Uh, this is a great one um, for calcareous conditions. So if you've got limey water or limey soil, it tolerates calcareous soils very well. <clears throat> Asclepius mashoei, um, all of my uh, searches, surveys, and inventories for this species demonstrate that it probably need, there needs to be more discussion about listing it um, because it is a, it has become a very rare species. And um, I, uh, I usually only find a handful of plants in a site at a time. And it's also proven difficult in that it's one of two species of upland milkweed that does not seem to tolerate being transplanted and does not tolerate root propagation very well. So the other species that uh, doesn't tolerate translocation very well is Asclepius obovata. Macho's milkweed is also the only other milkweed in Florida other than butterfly milkweed that does not have white latex sap. It has clear through sap. Uh, clear through sap. Asclepius obovata, which I mentioned a little while ago, um, the, the pine woods milkweed. It's a very odd looking milkweed that is most common in the central to western panhandle. Um, but there are populations um, that uh, we have discovered that need to be formally vouchered that are in Leon County, Wakulla County, Taylor County, and probably farther east as well. So uh, we're growing this and making it available. Uh, Asclepius pedicillata. So this is another species that, although small and diminutive, uh, it compensates for that small size, typically in large numbers, if the natural community is in good health. And so even though it's very small, it can have a tap root that can be a meter deep. <laughs> and uh, it lives for a very, very long time. And um, usually only flowers in uh, pine flatwoods, scrubby flatwoods, right after a burn. In an open savanna situation, such as Kissimmee Prairie, you may actually see them flower every year where there's not as much competition with uh, or shade out from needles or from trees. Uh, Asclepius perennis is one of the most popular uh, milkweeds. Uh, it's in cultivation. Most native plant nurseries carry it now. Um, even though it is small, it is very easy to grow. And despite being called aquatic milkweed, it does not require an aquatic situation to grow. It will grow in moist situations. It'll even grow in the moist end of dry situations uh, fairly well. Um, the seeds have a very high viability, very easy to germinate. You can also propagate the entire plant by cutting. And on top of that, it has proven to be a subject of intense research because it is the only native milkweed that remains evergreen year round across most of the state of Florida. And so what that has demonstrated is that as climate change has moved in and as temperatures have warmed, more and more monarchs are not migrating to Mexico. And <clears throat> many of them are able to begin to oviposit eggs in December, January, and February because this native plant exists here. And so it's a, a subject of intense research um, because of that, because it seems that uh, an increasing number of uh, migratory monarchs deciding to get off the highway in the air, off the flyaway and stay here is because of this plant right here. So really good plant. 
Uh, and just to show you, so those seeds have no comas. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's the only milkweed that produces seeds that do not have those coma cottony tufts. Uh, Sclepius rubra is a rare species that we have cultivated with success from the Western Panhandle. Um, and despite growing in very wet conditions where you would not think that it requires a very deep, large tuberous root, it does in fact have a deep, large tuberous root that penetrates deep into uh, these sort of unified histic peat soils. And um, it grows slowly and is a, a long-lived wetland plant, um, but it's, aside from that, not hard to grow. Asclepias tomentosa, the velvet leaf milkweed, is probably my favorite milkweed species. And the reason for that is because it has a really uh, curious distribution. They're found here in peninsular Florida, and then they vanish going west and pop up again in four counties in eastern Texas, just east of Dallas and then in some isolated populations in the Carolinas. And on top of that, this is really the most important milkweed for coastal monarch butterfly resources uh, because it is 100% storm surge saltwater tolerant. It just rebounds immediately from storm surge. It does not care about hypersaline waters and just grows right back. It seems to be a barrier island specialist that we see on barrier islands along the Gulf Coast, ranging from the Panhandle all the way down to Marco Island and on interior sand ridges and in eroded dunes that are now sand hills. So a uh, really, really unique, unusual special plant and one of the favorite upland, upland plants of monarch butterflies. So Asclepius tuberosa, uh, we actually have several varieties of butterfly milkweed that you'll see in the state. Um, this is Asclepius tuberosa varolfsii. It has the most widespread distribution of milkweeds, but um, it is usually not high density anywhere that you see it, aside from a few places. And uh, also, uh, despite being very, very beautiful and widespread across the continent, it is probably one of the least favorite milkweeds of monarch butterflies because it has a very minimal value as far as toxicity is concerned. And so they will eat it, but they will generally want to eat other more toxic milkweeds first. Asclepius verticillata is uh, widespread across the state and uh, our surveys and our sort of our evaluation of the phytotaxi, uh, phytotaxi of, of, of the species, the morphology of it has been that um, there seems to be something going on with these, these in, in South Florida. Uh, world milkweed anywhere south of Orlando tend to grow in wet prairies and in wet flatwoods. And world milkweeds north of that sort of unofficial line tend to grow in scrubs and in sand hills. And in addition to that, um, many uh, Many officials around the country that work with monarchs and work with world milkweed in northern states uh, did not realize that uh, Asclepius verticillata in Florida is not clonal. So up north, it produces huge carpets of stems. In Florida, these plants are solitary plants that are clumping, but not clonal. And so that was, that's a really important distinction to keep in mind with these plants. Um, versus those found across the rest of the country. Uh, Sclepius variegata, the red ring milkweed, its distribution hugs uh, the northern tier along the state line, but it can be common in a few places. Um, it loves beach magnolia ecosystems, upland mixed woodlands, high pine, um, and is a fire dependent species in most instances. It's very beautiful and it's very easy to grow. Asclepius veritiflora, the comet milkweed, is a pretty super endangered milkweed found here in Florida. It's common throughout the rest of the, through many parts of the eastern United States and in a few outlier populations in the western United States, but it is a legitimate calcophile. 
So in the wild, it grows in calcareous glades where there's actual limestone at the surface. And in those places, it is usually sympatric with another milkweed species, green antelope horn. The implications and all of that is that this is a great milkweed for growing and uh, cultivating it and planting it in places that are subject to a lot of calcium carbonate, subject to a lot of lime because they like really limey soils. So along a, a sidewalk, medians of the road, parking lots, these are, these are places where this plant does best. Hostile, relatively dry, calcareous environments, both natural and artificial. Asclepius viridis is the limestone outcrop counterpart to uh, Asclepius viridiflora, and it has this really unusual distribution where it's found in these three disjunct populations around the state. So the central panhandle and then the limestone boulder outcrops of the Brooksville Ridge um, in uh, central Florida, and then it's found on Miami Oolite in uh, Miami-Dade, and then it's found uh, throughout uh, the Keys, uh, but most notably on Big, Big Pine Key, which is where the largest populations have been documented. So just a few notes on Asclepius curasavica. Um, so it just needs to be known for anyone that's uh, listening that this is not a native milkweed. Uh, this is, I like to say that this milkweed is native to the monarch, but not native to Florida, because the, this milkweed is found naturally within the range of the monarch butterfly, but not the part of the range that's in Florida. So Southern Mexico and in Central America is where you would naturally uh, we're, uh, observe this, this milkweed growing. In uh, various parts of Florida, notably in South Florida, hundreds of thousands of these plants are grown on a regular basis <clears throat> and are shipped in climate controlled containers all over the country um, to various stores and nurseries. It's also a pan-tropical uh, plant that's found uh, all around the world. Um, you can go to nooks and crannies on islands, on continents, and if it's uh, somewhere within uh, the, the, somewhere close to the equator um, or within one of the tropical lines, you're likely to um, find this plant growing there. It's caused a lot of issues uh, purportedly for monarch butterflies, but it's really important for us to keep in mind that aside from just the fact that it's not native, there's some other implications with it. So if you are going to uh, purchase this plant and cultivate it in your yard, you should have an underlying philosophy that says that you are utilizing this plant as a conservation tool to help declining monarchs whilst you transition your yard into a landscape that is dominated by native milkweeds. And there's a number of issues with growing this plant. One I mentioned earlier that it is a host for OE, the protozoan organism that hurts monarch butterflies. Well, the reason why it's a host for OE is because this, this milkweed, as the name implies, is tropical and therefore does not senesce and die back to the ground every year like all of our native milkweeds do, except for aquatic milkweed. And so what has happened across much of the state is artificial populations of monarch butterflies have been, uh, have been, have created, created themselves because these milkweeds don't die back to the ground like native milkweeds do. And this uh, phenomenon occurs where if the plant does not die back to the ground, the OE vector persists at the top of the plant and uh, builds in number. And so when monarchs return, when monarchs arrive on their migration on their way south or upon their return in the spring, they land on milkweeds that in, in many cases never died back and are immediately inoculated with OE. And so if you are going to use this plant whilst you transition into a yard that is dominated by native milkweeds, I encourage you to manage this non-native milkweed as if it were a native milkweed, and in the fall of the year, usually after Thanksgiving, to cut it back to the ground. And in doing so, that tends to mitigate 
um, to some degree uh, for the OE issue that's found on the plants. And so in addition to that, um, many folks uh, may purchase this milkweed from a nursery um, or a store where they have not confirmed if the plant has been sprayed with neonicotinoids, with insecticides, a type of insecticide. When, uh, when these milkweeds and many other plants are sprayed with an insecticide that has neonicotinoids in it, the nicotin neonicotinoids can be absorbed into the tissues on the plant and through the stomata on the leaves and essentially bioaccumulate in the leaves of the plant. So when you hear about someone saying that they purchased a, not, a milkweed from a store, they brought it home and they had monarchs and then all of the monarchs suddenly died and fell off of the plant, there are many instances where it's because the, the caterpillars fed on milkweed vegetation that had at some point been sprayed with neonicotinoids. Um, and neonicotinoids can remain in the leaves and in the stems of some of these plants variably from a few months to, in some species, a few years. So you want to really ensure that you um, are purchasing these plants if you are going to use them while transitioning into a yard dominated by native milkweeds in a way that is cognizant to that neonicotinoid issue. And then on top of that, for the sake of Florida's native plant communities, you know, many uh, category one and category two invasive milkweeds began as isolated populations like these right here. This is along the Caloosahatchee River in this, this photograph. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is another photograph that's farther north in the central peninsula. The plants are definitely expanding across, across Florida. They're becoming uh, established in a number of places, both natural communities and non-natural communities. And so keep in mind that we don't, we don't really know what, what these plants can do just yet, what they're capable of. We don't know if this could become an invasive issue, but also keep in mind that those plants are harboring OE out there in the wild since those plants don't die back. And so that can create some issues uh, for monarch butterflies as, as we've talked about. And so uh, it's been a lot of work uh, to study these plants, research these plants, rescue these plants. These plants are very important to me. Um, and uh, generally, I, when I look at a landscape, I say to myself, if you manage for the milkweed, you manage for the entire landscape because these milkweeds depend on very healthy natural communities for their continued survival and reproduction. And so um, I'll go ahead and leave this screen up. And um, for those that have a set of questions, um, you can rather look up the Facebook page or you can look up, uh, you can email us at that uh, Gmail right there. Um, and uh, we can get in, we can get into the weeds, no pun intended, with whatever questions you may have. And also I put several links at the bottom there that are good baseline websites to learn more about what's being done for milkweeds, what's being done for monarchs, and also to learn more about species of, of milkweeds and other native plants in general. And with that, I'll go ahead and leave this screen on and I am done. Turn my mic back on. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat. Scott, are you willing to field some questions? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Tammy would like to know: Can you grow milkweed in sandy soil? Yes, you can grow milkweed in sandy soil. <clears throat> um, Milkweeds that grow in super nutrient poor, sandy, acidic soils are probably going to grow pretty slow. So uh, butterfly milkweed, um, sandhill milkweed, uh, Curtis's milkweed, um, and a number of others will grow in sand, um, but uh, you can expect for it to take a while for them to get established. So if you're looking to establish them yourself, um, often it's better if you're cultivating them at your house in some containers um, to uh, give them a, you can, you can grow them 
like artificially and, uh, you know, give them a little bit more moisture or you can add some soil nutrients to, uh, to the sand to increase the vigor and harden them off quicker. Uh, but yes, there are many species of native milkweed that will grow in very sandy soil, both xeric dry, mesic moist, and hydric wet. Great. And Jacqueline asks, I haven't seen a slide yet that shows milkweeds in Monroe County. Do any grow in the Keys? So uh, <clears throat> Asclepius viridis, the green uh, antelope horn is uh, probably the most common native milkweed in the Keys. And the majority of the populations, and some would argue all of the populations, have been found and vouchered on Big Pine Key. So Big Pine Key, uh, notably Key Deer Refuge, uh, many of those roads from the that they put in years ago for, for failed subdivisions and whatnot, they're, they're just, they put them right through on bare limestone. So if you uh, drive through there, you, you can find Asclepius viridis uh, growing in naturally occurring populations and they're still super fire dependent. If they don't burn correctly, Asclepius viridis is usually consumed by a lot of uh, tropical herbaceous species. Um, other than that, Asclepius tuberosa butterfly milkweed has been found in the Upper Keys, um, and world milkweed has been found in the Upper Keys. Um, but for the for the Keys, uh, green antelope horn is the absolute best native milkweed that you can go with. All right, and it looks like you have a slide for how people can contact you. So that's great, thank you. And just for people who are in Pine Lily Chapter, we do have that plant sale, that plant pickup that Taylor does. So, and she can pick up milkweed for you from Green Isle. Or if you wanna to go to Green Isle yourself, that's the closest place to buy native milkweed. So. Any parting thoughts, Scott? There are no more questions. I don't know, um, just, uh... <clears throat> If you uh, have the space, or even if you don't have the space, use a container, but get, get some native milkweeds out there. <clears throat> and uh, it's surprising, even if you're on Key Biscayne, um, or if you're in uh, downtown Tampa, or you're on a, a balcony, if you put a, a native milkweed in a container, the monarchs will inevitably find it, they will use it, and you are contributing to a potential increase to help the offset the decrease that has afflicted monarchs across the country. So other than that, thank you to everyone for listening. Yes, and thank you for presenting, presenting Scott. We really appreciate it. And uh, have cool. a great night. You too. Thanks, Valerie.